Welcome to our panel discussion. I'm Thomas Robinson, VP of Strategic Partnerships and Corporate Development here at Domino Data Lab. We're excited to have this panel of healthcare rock stars, including Andrea D'Souza, Global Head of Data Sciences and Engineering at Eli Lilly, Susan Huang, VP of Oncology Analytics at McKesson, and Rima Almadine, VP of America's Healthcare and Life Sciences Business at NVIDIA. This is a great blend of leadership across data science, analytics, and AI infrastructure, here to discuss some of the most innovative applications of data science and analytics in this challenging yet innovative time. So to start, um, Andrea, tell us a little bit about Eli Lilly and, and what do you do there? Thank you, Thomas, for inviting me to be on this panel. And uh, Susan and Rima, always a pleasure to reconnect with both of you. Eli Lilly is a medicines company. We're over 145 years old. And the way I like to think of Eli Lilly is we're the company that brought you insulin. We have a strong, strong heritage of invention and innovation. We're on track to deliver 20 medicines in 10 years. And we have one of the most uh, entrepreneurial cultures inside the walls of a pharmaceutical company. So what do I do at Eli Lilly? We have this saying at Lilly, we deliver answers that matter. And so the way I like to think of my role, I deliver answers that matter with technology that matters. So I run our enterprise HPC team, our architecture team, our data platforms and operations team, AI ML platforms and operations, and translational informatics, deriving value for data from data for our partners in Lilly Research Labs. That's great. Uh, Susan, tell us about McKesson and your, your role there. Yeah, um, well, thanks for having me and um, good to be here with Rima and Andrea. So uh, I work for McKesson as the Vice President of Oncology Analytics and specifically I support one of the business units there, the US Oncology Network. The network is the nation's largest network of community oncology practices. We see one in six cancer patients in the United States. And my job is to help enable data, data decision making in, in to run a, a cancer center. And that comes from everything from managed care contracting through uh, looking at competitive intelligence, business development for our practices, as well as things such as clinical decision support. It's wonderful. And Rima, tell us about NVIDIA and your role there. Yeah, first, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, as folks attending GTC know, NVIDIA is the artificial intelligence supercomputing technology leader. And what's unique about NVIDIA is that we offer a, a full stack solution uh, with data center scale. It starts with the chips and systems at the bottom layer of the stack, followed by the acceleration and AI layer. And at the top, we offer a domain specific layer. And for example, um, in healthcare and life sciences, we offer Clara, which is a suite of frameworks and tools to accelerate the development of AI models and workflows. And I'm responsible for the healthcare life sciences and manufacturing business in the Americas. And uh, what, what myself and my team do is we work with customers looking to drive innovation and transformation by leveraging data science and AI and accelerate computing to solve some of their biggest challenges and uh, grow their business. So um, with the healthcare transformation and the digital biology revolution that's underway, we're seeing AI and uh, accelerated computing computing drive breakthroughs across the entire healthcare uh, uh, continuum. And uh, so it's it's a really exciting time to be in this space. That's great. So um, here's where I wanted to start. Uh, Domino uh, is very passionate about uh, unleashing data science to solve some of the world's most challenging problems. And we love hearing about how customers are leveraging ML ops. Um, so I maybe want to start uh, with some of the use cases or exciting applications of, of data science and analytics. Uh, so Susan, why don't we start with you? So from where you sit on the oncology analytics team at McKesson, maybe tell us about your interaction with the data science team and how do you leverage that data science in, in analytics? How do you maximize business impact across the teams? 
Yeah, so I, I think uh, our interaction with data science is that, you know, we, we believe it is a core competency and we need to be better at it. So we actually, our team has data scientists on the team, as well as we work with our enterprise organizations uh, who have also another group of uh, data scientists as well that we work with. But how I think about how we leverage data science in our, in our work is a couple things. One, uh, we take a step back. My background is not your most technical data scientist there. I'm a clinical pharmacist first and then a strategic marketer, strategic marketer second. So we start with to best to best get that impact. I think of what is that business problem or outcome we're trying to solve for? What's that unmet need? And then back into that. And one of the things I've noticed is that we work in a very, in cancer care, it's a very fluid complex, ambiguous environment. And so sometimes when we think about data science in this space, it's not so clear cut like you might if you were in a consumer based business where you have like an, an Amazon where your purchasing patterns are more regular and you can use up, apply data science in that way. Ours is a bit different. I would say where we would prioritize is where our executive organization prioritizes its priorities first and go from there. That's how I think we get the biggest impact. The second thing that we also do is if I think about how we run a cancer practice across the three dimensions of clinical, financial, and operational, we apply data science and advanced analytics in all three spectrums. To give you an example of some, some of the things that we do in this space, uh, on the clinical side, we have to think about the chemotherapy treatment re regimens, usually they're a combination and cocktails of treatment. So you have to think about sequencing treatment. So what we do is we apply advanced analytics to, to help advise what's the next, next best action as a way to help make sure that it's evidence-based and applies the patient's parameters to it. On the financial side, uh, because we work uh, to negotiate payer contracts, a lot of times we are leaders in the value-based care space. So what that means is in addition to have, delivering high quality care, we have to bend the cost curve so it's more affordable for patients. So what that means is we take on risk. Uh, we have to be able to predict what's the likelihood of payback if we don't um, actually deliver uh, on um, bending the cost curve. So we apply advanced analytics data science in that space too, so that we know how to go after uh, different contracts with different payers. And the third space I would say is if we think about operations, uh, the patient experience, how important that is to, to apply data science in that way, because the in its, our experience starts before they even get through our door. How do we make sure that as the patient is diagnosed, in the community, how do we make sure that we are able to catch them and be able to get them into their system in a seamless manner so that they have, that should be their least of their worries among uh, in their cancer journey, so. Uh, that's great. Andrea, how about you? Some of the applications at Eli Lilly. Yeah, so what's uh, remarkable is a lot of the use cases that Susan was talking about, I've got partners in my organization who are working with our commercial organization to solve for some of those um, use cases. Understanding the patient journey and how you can get to the next best action to actually solve complex uh, challenges like adherence, like persistency are also part of what we're trying to accomplish. I actually support the scientists way on the early side. So examples of things we'd be looking at would actually be things like understanding single cell trajectories, for different disease states. So we recently uh, did some work in uh, rheumatoid arthritis and immunology, it's been published. And we're hoping we'll have a follow-up uh, webinar with Dem uh, uh, Domino in a little bit here. Another example is what we call clinical trial for research or clinical trial data for research. And it's an application we've actually built where we have embedded an NLP find capability so we can, you know, kind of comb through all of our clinical trial data, come up with hypotheses or questions of interest that we want to understand, responders, non-responders, what's going on underneath with the biology, with the genomics, with the genetics. So we'll form data sciences teams. Uh, we'll get the statistical plans approved by our statistics department. And then we'll go ahead and make sure we have the data and all of the guardrails, because we work in a regulated industry, to answer those questions of scientific interest. 
lots of image analysis use cases. Uh, Rima alluded to uh, some of the capabilities that they provide. So one example that comes to mind in neuroscience is understanding drug reuptake in segmented brain regions. Tons and tons of natural language processing across the enterprise. And just recently, an amazing use case on Domino for manufacturing batch product release. So we can't really at this point count the number of use cases. And it's really, really tough to keep up with our scientists all over our enterprise. That's great to hear. The pervasiveness of, of data science is, is interesting. Um, Rima, how about you? You have a different perspective across a, a broad set of NVIDIA customers. Um, uh, what, what do you see? Yeah, um, so what great uh, examples, Andrea and Susan, uh, that you shared. Um, so at NVIDIA, we're excited about the new problems we're able to tackle with new innovations in the AI space. And ju just to give you an example, um, transformer-based neural networks now can address a whole new set of problems in varied domains, such as language, genomics, chemistry, and imaging. And what's really exciting is that these new networks, uh, these neural networks, uh, can learn the language of these diverse data types using unsupervised learning. And this is significant since it's hard to generate large labeled data sets in healthcare. So by using unsupervised learning, we overcome this challenge. And, uh, and then what we could do is we can fine tune the model to a specific task using supervised learning. And let me just share with you a few examples to bring what I'm saying to life. Like, um, for example, in the drug discovery space, uh, we are actually using these techniques uh, for protein design. For example, we partnered with AstraZeneca to build a model that learns the language of chemistry and then it can be used for uh, molecule generation. And um, also, as we all know, Google's AlphaFold transformer can predict a protein structure from an amino acid sequence. Um, and more recently, I'm sure you all saw the news about um, in Silico Medicine announcing the first a molecule that was created totally from scratch with AI, and now they're in first phase clinical trials. And uh, what's really unique is that this um, the, the whole process leveraged AI from identifying the target to uh, to designing the molecule, and this whole process took thirty months and three point five uh, million dollars, which we you know we all know is a fraction of what it, of what it takes to uh, bring a drug um, that far into the process. Uh, and so shifting gears a little bit and talking about like uh, using this technology in medical centers, we, um, we're also seeing this be, being used in, uh, in these medical centers to build specialized um, languages, like to take all the EMR data in a medical center and build uh, an NLP model that uses that institution's uh, language. So we worked with the University of Florida recently and they built a state-of-the-art clinical NLP model. Um, and what they're doing with this model is they plan to use it to match patients to clinical trials and uh, for doctors to predict patient complications. So just a ton of great uh, applications of this uh, cutting edge technology. That's great. So. Um... A lot of these use cases reflect a, a serious need for blending uh, domain-specific uh, knowledge and expertise with uh, technology and data science expertise. So maybe we can spend a little time digging into the org structure of how you bring uh, those teams and capabilities together. And, and so maybe starting with you, Andrea, how do you manage projects across the, the sort of business team, if you will, the domain experts and, and more technical teams? Yeah, so we have four different therapeutic areas that we support, and then we have our larger, you know, molecule innovation areas. So we have this role that we've defined called a business relationship manager, and they tend to have enough domain and technical expertise to understand their area, and then they partner with the business to source, if you will, those projects and questions of scientific interest. We then create that portfolio of projects 
typically map out what are the teams and what we would need to deliver against that. Document the analysis plans so that we can actually reduce them to practice in the domino. I call domino my electronic computational notebook. And then we go ahead and a team, data engineer, data scientist, business expert, operations person all come together to actually solve and deliver value back to the business. So that's our tactical model. Organizationally, we're completely what we call a hub and spoke. So depending upon who to talk to, I might be perceived as a hub. To somebody else, I'm a spoke. But they're embedded over all parts of the value chain. Lily's culture advocates for what we call the team of teams approach. So very network model and the teams come together. We're incentivized to actually collaborate across the organization. To build upon a specific example that uh, Rima just talked about uh, with AlphaFold, for example, when AlphaFold was initially released, there was a certain amount of excitement and we leveraged that excitement. And then we had to be pragmatic about it inside the walls. We had to set up the infrastructure to make sure our scientists could use it. And then we also did some additional work to develop, if you will, confidence intervals around our assessment of when it worked well versus when it didn't work so well. We are now in the process of deploying or neighboring both the Molecule Innovation Hub and our therapeutic areas to consume or use that in an efficient way. That's great. Um, Susan, uh, talk to us about where it makes sense to bifurcate organizations between engineering, data science, and, and analytics, and, and maybe tell us more broadly how you structure your team. You know, first, Andrea, um, I'm very impressed with the organization you have. So our journey is for earlier on in the, the process, I would say what I, I really think that, you know, Andrea, that the business relationship management uh, function you, you described is very much something I think is necessary. As we think about the idea of advancing data and analytics, um, there's a cultural shift too, right? Um, you, it's not just the technical piece, <laughs> the data scientists, you need to have the business side also meet you there too. And the ability for your organization, Andrea, that be able to make that bridge, I think is really critical. And I think that's a great best practice. Uh, you know, for me, where I'm sitting, I sit on the on a business unit side, we follow a, a hub spoke kind of model. We have a central team that, 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 that we leverage to make sure that we can go at scale when we think about things as platform selection, um, where we can think about learning from other business units. But what I like about our federated model is because the US Oncology Network is somewhat a little bit different than the other parts of McKesson, it allows us to still work on our efforts. So on the business side, we actually don't bifurcate. We, our team, my team has a combination in, of, of folks, cross-functional, multidisciplinary, much like what you think of a, of a sports team. So we have on our team, data engineers, architects, as well as data scientists, business analysts, and also domain experts. So on our team, because we touch everything from managed care through clinical decision support, we have data experts who actually, whose background training might be in areas such as actuary on the insurance side, or as well as uh, surgeons, physicians, as well as pharmacists who then have gotten backgrounds in coding in languages such as Python and whatnot that we use for our uh, modeling purposes. So. We don't bifurcate, actually, and but, but what we do is we work very closely on both ends. So the technical team within our, our enterprise, we work very closely to build out our platform. And then um, on the business side, the folks that have had the experience in the field but and can translate and bridge that with our different functions and segments. And actually, our customers, our, our practices, uh, they, they speak that language, so they, they interface on that front end in that way. Yeah. So and, and I would completely say we're by no means perfect. I don't want to give that impression. This is a huge learning experience. And the other side of our equation is sometimes it's too chaotic. Right? You can't actually 
keep up and you're managing to some very different complex priorities. So we're starting to try and do what we're calling dynamic prioritization, but it's quite difficult sometimes because the use cases to the point that I think they're so diverse, right? Yeah. Yeah. What does dynamic prioritization mean? Or what does that look like? (laughs) It basically means be opportunistic. So it's, you know, having worked at NVIDIA, I I, kind of say we want to be a little NVIDIA-like where, if there's a insight that we think makes a lot of sense, we want to find a way to follow that through. Because sometimes you can do a data sciences project and the answer is you were completely way off. And other times you do the data sciences project and you find something you're like, that's worth following up on. So that's kind of what we mean. We want to leave room in a very resource constrained system to be more opportunistic. That's great. Interesting. Tell us what you're excited about at NVIDIA and what you'd like to add to that. Yeah, I mean, uh, th- this was uh, um, it was great to hear Andrea and Susan describe how their um, how what, what they're doing from an organizational perspective. What we're seeing is exactly this hub and spoke that, that you both described. What we're seeing is organizations embed data scientists in the business units so that they can align with those business outcomes. But at the same time, uh, they're also building these AI centers of excellence, sort of like what Andrea, you said, the hub. Uh, and the reason for that is that you need to create also some, um, you need a body or a group of people to create some governance and, and build the collaborative uh, atmosphere for sharing insights across the business units, provide common tools and algorithms and uh, so that not every business unit has to go and come up with their own tooling. So it's it's having both, having data scientists that are close to the business and understand the business problems, but also have that center of excellence that's coming up with some of these um, common tools and, and helping share insights, models, algorithms, and, and creating the structure so that the enterprise can quickly adopt and scale their models across the organization. That's great. So now that we talked a little bit about the organizational perspective. Maybe we can talk about uh, talent, which I know is something uh, on everybody's minds, especially as a lot of talent is, is moving around currently. Um, so Susan, uh, you, you mentioned you have uh, teams that help, uh, you build teams that help fill the gap between uh, the business and, and technical. What, what type of um, talent do you need to uh, fill in that particular role with a with a cross discipline skill set yeah uh, this is a tough one I think the the uh, the talent building is tough because the the demand for data and analytics talent is so hot and then and when you work in a space like cancer care it's very esoteric <laughs> um, so it's a combination of both that make it hard and actually we were, I was talking to our CIO who was newer to the organization he said well how, what do you do and so we take a I'll just say a scrappy approach to this. It's going to be a blend of taking, we took uh, in our transformation, we took a blend of folks who understood the domain very well, but had the, the appetite and the aperture to lean in on the data in, in terms of their upskilling. At the same time, we had to upgrade talent where we had to bring in folks who had the built in know-how, the, the, the data engineering background to do that and then meet them halfway. They then had to build their understanding of the business discipline. So it was a combination of both. Um, in terms of that portfolio management role where they interface more, we I don't know if we have a formula for success, but what we've done is we took folks who had the domain understanding because we felt that we felt that the understanding of oncology was most important to us and then understood the data well and the data process well, and then trained them up on their data product management capabilities. Um, and that's what we have found to be a successful formula for that portfolio management um, function. I'm curious, uh, tell me a little bit more about that uh, upskilling. What are the what are the types of uh, training that you use, materials that you use? How do you how do you build yeah. that build that content? Source it externally, build it internally? A bit of both. I, I think um, this is where, you know, 
uh, we are of the belief that you know a company's data strategy is very bespoke and unique to each company. You, you can't replicate a data strategy, and so for us. The understanding of uh, cancer care is one thing where we're, there's external resources for that, but then understanding how cancer care is done in the community, that's where the field work happens. So you can't be a, a credible data scientist without having gone into the field. So due to COVID, we're, if it wasn't for COVID, we'd be out in the field in the practices uh, working with, with the clinicians and the administrators and the folks running the business. But in the absence of that, they are part of the meetings. They're part of the um, planning meetings, as well as um, being part of the discussion of the strategic setting. And then on the technical side, uh, it's a combination. We, we had to commit to what is our tech stack? So for us, uh, what mattered most was to use open source language, such as Python, for our modeling. And so we made sure that those that need it start first and then hire in people with built in language. And then for our data engineering and data engineering and architect team, because we're cloud based, we a transition cloud based, we have to be able to learn the, the, the necessary tools and platforms to run there. So it's a bit a combination of both, if that helps. That's great. And Rima, i um, curious about NVIDIA talent. I've got to spend a ton of time working with NVIDIA folks and I'm, I'm always impressed. I'm curious um, how you think about multidisciplinary talent and, and talent retention at, at NVIDIA. Yeah, so um, the way we think about it is the brightest minds want to unlock great opportunities and they want to work with other talented people. And um, at NVIDIA, we are actually creating AI, so we need the best minds in the industry. And to attract the best talent, uh, we give our data scientists the opportunity to work on big problems, and we provide them with access to supercomputing infrastructure with the latest software tools so that they could do uh, cutting-edge work. Data scientists are not going to join an organization where they have to go and convince leaders that investing in AI is important. Uh, they need to know that they'll be able to be productive right away and be able to solve you know, important and big problems. And um, most big problems require a multidisciplinary approach. So in addition to hiring very strong data scientists, we also hire um, domain experts like just as an example, in the healthcare space um, and uh, healthcare and life sciences, we, we hire computational chemists, we hire uh, bioinformatics folks, imaging experts, and many more that work hand in hand with the data scientists. Um, and also, we know that this field is dynamic, it's evolving very rapidly. So it's important that we create an environment of continuous learning and experimentation so that we not only attract the best talent, that we can actually retain the best talent. And speaking of that, Andrea, I'm curious, uh, what, what helps you retain talent? Um, you know, tools, infrastructure, what, like what, what is the, what keeps people uh, at Eli Lilly? So, uh, you know, I think right now retaining talent is really, really tough, especially when you've got competition like NVIDIA, like Google, like Amazon that are entering our market in a different way. I think folks that come to work for us and with us come because of the purpose, right? We unite caring with discovery to make lives better. This year, we're aiming to make 45 million lives better, you know, so. Um, that's why people come here for that opportunity to work on taking oncology data and getting to insights for Brazilio, one of the best, you know, breast cancer drugs that's out there. Partnering with companies that want to look at ret alterations for lung cancer. So our why is, is why people come here. Now, what kind of environment can we create? Uh, we too believe or ascribe to the learning environment. So four years ago when I got here and we'd finished our strategy, we had very systematic approaches to upskilling. So there was upskilling in data engineering and there was upskilling with leadership and helping them do strategic planning, problem formation, conceptualization. And then there was also augmentation of staff through our postdoc program. So we kind of finished that wave and they've grown. 
tremendously, tremendously talented group. And now we've got folks trying to steal them away. So the game's changed. So we're currently trying to figure out in this very, very complex dynamic environment where location matters less, how are we going to retain folks? But that tie back to environment, to culture, to mission and unleashing their potential on these complex, complex problems and disease is where we believe part of the answer is. That's great. Um, do you guys want to hit on anything else related to talent? I know that was something that was pretty important when we were doing prep. Um, so I, I think from my perspective, I'd love to see, uh, you know, clearly this AI thing is here to stay, whether you want to call it AI, data sciences, machine learning. And in America, I think that we need more systematic investment. It's wonderful to see what some of the bigger companies are doing to actually help the next generation get there faster. So yeah, pipeline is key. We do a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And there are some segments of the population that continue to be underrepresented. So how can all of the partners in the ecosystem here, through initiatives like 110, make a difference towards building that next generation? Would be my ask of the community. I don't know, Susan. Remember? Yeah, you know, um, same. I, I think for us, what the things we're experimenting with is there is a hunger and a desire to transition into data and analytics. There's no doubt about that. And to your point, you know, we're not going to be able to compete against the amazing toolbox that, you know, Rima, you were, your, your company can provide, but I think that the mission matters. What I think is really interesting when we work with the rest of our organization, McKesson is when they get to work with our business units from other units, they're like, Oh, we get to, we get to help patients lives. Um, and I think that's, that matters. I think the other thing I was going to say, we do um, um, this program called Free Agent. So it allows folks within our company, no matter where they are, to stretch themselves in different ways. And then within the various different units, we post, hey, here's what we need. It allows them to practice a skill, ex get exposure to within the organization as well. And that allows us to retain talent, but build that pipeline as well and you know get exposure out there for diff learning other business units as well that's what we we've we've been working with um that has been a good way for us to actually recruit folks from other fo parts of our organization as well yeah I, I love that uh marketing there to your point on your strategic marketer call free agent <laughs> we call them short-term assignments which are yeah. remarkably uh less uh sexy if you will but um, we do something similar, and sometimes when we bring more business-minded folks into the scientific domain, you kind of watch them pause and get so intimidated and scared. And then I love that process where at the end of it, they've learned so much, they've appreciated it, and then they get, you know, sometimes promoted because they're earlier in their career, and they're just awed by the very fact that they could actually learn it. Yeah. And it's wonderful to see the cross fertilization happen. Yeah, actually, those are great ideas. And actually, you know, Andrew, to what you said, they learn it. But also, what's really great is then everyone else in the group learns other things from mm -hmm. from the business perspective. So I feel like when you mix a group and have different skill sets, you're raising the game for everyone because yeah. um, everyone is learning new skills. So those are great ideas. Great. Let's, uh, let's move on a little bit and talk about everybody's favorite topic, tools and infrastructure and data. Um, um, maybe we can uh, chat a little bit first, Susan, about, uh, I know data has to be foundational to your, uh, your team, um, both from the, the data you pull in and also how you uh, communicate out. Um, how do you manage a, a massive proliferation of data and access to data across um, your organization? Yeah. Um, so 
We, a lot of our data sources are internal, I would call source data. Um, our, we own our own electronic medical record system. Uh, we, we have our own billing system. We have, um, we have also our patient visit scheduling system. And then we also, uh, because we have work with a lot of different partner with a lot of payers, we have to also keep track of the different payer claims data as well. And it's at the PHI, uh, PHI or patient health information level. So one of the things that's very important to us is because we handle some among the most sensitive data types out there of patient health information. Uh, we have to have governance and data management as paramount. This is, it's, it's not a, option. It is something that's most important to us. And so one of the things we think about from that piece, um, two things. One, if we can't organize the data in a way that makes sense, it's not even just big data, it's about right data. And if you can't have the basics, you can't have the fancy stuff such as AI and data science. So that's cool. number one. Number two, I think is how important our legal security and compliance partners are to us. We, they are a part of the governance structure. They're part of our team. And they what we have found to be a very successful model is actually bringing them very early upstream and just assume they're part of the team. Because that way they make sure that we're, we have the right guardrails, we have the right encryption in place so that our, our, our data we're handling responsibly and we're providing insights in the right way back to the, our, our care team. Sure. Andrea, how about you? Um, tools, yeah. infrastructure, data. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, everything Susan said completely applies to how we work inside the walls of pharma with the sensitive uh, data. For data as a whole, in the last uh, three years, Lily has had a huge focus on uh, data. So within the research environment, we created a, a platform if you will, to ingest, transform, normalize all of our data. The platform's been created, and now we're systematically running marathons and onboarding data to that platform. We take all of the data products and we publish them to our enterprise data ecosystem. And where we are now in our journey is we're actually building much better search algorithms to actually find data sets. So you can get to that multimodal data set, some imaging, some genomics, some electronic health record data, bring it together to get better insights together. So we recently worked with um, one of NVIDIA's capabilities, Biomegatron, and then added on a, a, an additional uh, public uh, transformer model for an, uh, named entity recognition and have delivered an MVP for searching those data products in our marketplace. So that's how it's kind of coming full circle. We still have a long way to go on search, right? Because the data types are so different. You got metadata, both technical and business that you need to be able to tag appropriately, then index, and then search and deploy at scale. So it'll it'll take time, but we're definitely on our way to making that happen with all of our partners across uh, Lily Information and Digital Solutions. Um, it's not the first time I've heard about that multimodal data set and, and bringing bring those together. Maybe um, I'd, I'd love to hear like, where are we in that journey? And maybe what's the impact of multimodal data for those who are less familiar? What, what does that mean in terms of the, the, the business and health outcomes you can create? Oh, that's a big question. I think Susan and I, wouldn't we need a whole panel <laughs> on that topic? I think that's the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we will do that one though. That that's going to be fun to talk. I'm yeah. I'm now very curious, given that yeah. I've heard this several times. So yeah, but I mean, I, I'd have to dig back for when I was working in the commercial side. But you know, Susan talked about uh, electronic health records and claims data, right? And um, 
the reasons that oncology patients don't take their meds tends to be very different than the reasons diabetics don't take their meds. Right? And so you would put together electronic health records, patient reported outcomes, real world evidence data, you know, maybe social media data if you had access to it, and then try to get at some of the patterns on a population level. Yeah. Then once you've got at those patterns, you try to figure out, well, what's the next best action I could take? So I think there is some published data, for example, with mental illness. One of the lessons you learn is you don't actually need to tailor your next best action to the patient, but actually to their caregiver. So those would be the types of insights that you're after. A lot of the other stuff we're doing, I, I probably couldn't talk about because we would consider it a competitive advantage, if that makes sense. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, Rima, somebody who's a provider of, of AI infrastructure, um, how, do you, how do you see the, the space evolving? Yeah, um, so uh, the, the way we see this is uh, there is a need for um, openness and flexibility in the AI space. So data science is different than software engineering, uh, since data science is dependent on experimentation. And um, enterprise IT has evolved to prioritize standards and security I mean, for a good reason. Uh, but for data scientists to be successful, they need to be they need openness and flexibility. Um, so they need access uh, to data sets. I, I know Andrea and Susan were talking about how important it is you know, to have the right data and to secure it. Um, and it, it's really important that they are able to access this data and also that they have um, are able to access the latest cutting edge open source models and tools, as well as hybrid computing resources. So researchers have the flexibility to train where their data sets reside. So, um, you know, in addition, um, in addition to that, organizations committed to leading their business transformation with AI need an industrialized end-to-end -end development workflow from grooming the data. Uh, and, you know, we heard both from Andrea and Susan, all the complexities with, you know, with that data and figuring out how you get it into a format that then you can leverage um, in your AI models and then you can prototype and train at scale. Um, the good news is that there are a lot of digital tools to help with this whole process, both open source and off the shelf tools uh, that can help with the data prep, the scheduling experiments um, and uh, you know all the other steps. Like, like for example, uh, the workbench tool that uh, Domino Data Lab provides that helps uh, manage collaboration, drift, and security. That's great. Let's talk a little bit about um, scaling and operationalizing data science. Um, and, and maybe let's start with how you drive adoption of AI, ML, and data science. And, and obviously, nobody does that just for the sake of uh, the the technology or the algorithms. I mean, it, it's all connected to business outcomes. But um, maybe Andrea, how do you connect that? Um, you know, connect the importance of AI and ML to help drive adoption of those techniques that can ultimately uh, influence business outcomes. So this, I think, is really really tough, especially if within our walls we have a healthy amount of skepticism associated with. AI. Now, if we're talking more broadly, analytics and data sciences, right, we always lead with what's the business problem you're trying to solve. And if there then is a touch point by which, you know, machine learning, deep learning can potentially add value, we do the experiments. So in the experiments, we recently did one with a company called BioAI around uh, pathology. Susan, it'd be wonderful to tell you more details about this one because, you know, it was a, a, a rare alteration, RET, and we had very, very small sample sizes. And we didn't really think we were going to be able to figure out how AI could help with the problem. 
And our initial results are very, very positive, right? Uh, we've done something that we think if you could continue to work on, you could actually in the long run end up with the lung cancer detector. And Susan knows better than anyone, if you have a rare mutation, the way we do our uh, sequencing right now, um, you actually step through the different genetic tests. And by the time you get to this RET or the smaller uh, um, mutations, you might not have enough sample left, right? So what a horrible place for that patient when there is potentially a medicine that can completely help them if we don't even have enough sample to do the right testing. When upstream intervention by an AI model could be a potential solution. But there's so much work that needs to be done and then you gotta do the validation. Yeah. It really is complex. So it's, it's a journey. And uh, the ROI on this case is very, very clear. But you gotta step through that journey bit by bit. That's the science meeting impact for patients. The technology part I actually think is easier because we now have things like the right compute. We've got data, we've got innovation and algorithms for small sample sizes. We've got methods to annotate. We've got networks of pathologists available to annotate. And we've got tools like the data sciences environments. Um, the biggest thing we've done with Domino, with DNA Nexus, with some of the other capabilities is containerize our environments. And the ROI for us from a containerization perspective is huge. Other examples of how we're scaling, we'll find a use case where the initial investment is a little bit higher. We created a partnership environment for doing, uh, you know, analysis between an academic partner and Lily, very, very secure. The first one cost, you know, one or 200,000 to deliver. We've taken that same capability and deployed 32 environments, right? And now we just keep deploying them. The first one took months. Now we do them in a couple days. So Amazon loved it so much, they emulated it. So I think the technology is actually less rate limiting right now. It's getting the, the business and the stakeholders and the investment structure correctly in this very, very complex healthcare domain. I am curious. Containerized environments, not a term that a lot of people bring up as something that's important. Um, is that uh, because of reproducibility or, or like having a validated environment or what, what, are, what are the benefits? Um, so it's just for my engineers, right? Mm. Engineers never like to do something more than once, right? right. They love to build and then they want to maintenance and scalability used to be really, really easy. And then they want to go off to the next thing, right? So that build, deploy, scale, they really love the build, right? Especially when you have super, super smart folks. So that ability to just rinse and repeat with the containers, it's, it's at the point when they I ask them, give me a dashboard to tell me what the ROI on it is. It's like it's complex, right? So, so that's that all of the code associated with it is is amazing. I mean, for me, it's kind of funny, just personal moment. My dad was one of those captains of those really big ships, and he sailed on container ships. I've actually spent summers on container ships, and <laughs> when I finally learned what a container was, and I think it was Nvidia that taught me that. It was hilarious to learn that what we were trying to do was bend the cost curve borrowing from the shipping industry so that's great um susan how about how about you um you know operationalizing uh uh 
data science and, and driving adoption? Is that something that's a challenge for your organization or, or, or just as long as you do it well, everybody's right there uh, on the curve growing? I, I think it, it's a variable, uh, but I think two things. One, Andrea, to build on your comment, I think that on the technical side, we're at a place where I think the hurdle, the technical hurdle is lower. And so if you think about the analogy of, uh, you know, crawl, walk, run, we may be at a place very soon. You don't have to even walk. You just run after you crawl. And I, I think of the bad analogy, but, you know, PowerPoints or slides. It used to be back in the 80s, there were departments who had to create uh, little slides and for you and everything else. And now it's not even, a, it's a get, it's an assumption. You don't even ask for that interview question. Can you use, can you type, can you use, can you build PowerPoint? It's just a given. And so I think that hopefully there will be a day where core competency is such that data science becomes language, becomes a natural part of anybody's skill and repertoire, uh, even for business folks. I think the thing for me is uh, if I think about the modeling and the analytics and data science in the practice, the modeling is not the hard part. It's really the adoption in the field. And so taking back, stepping back and, and actually taking a product management or product design approach, design thinking makes sense to apply upfront. Do you understand what is the problem you're solving for and how the, re the real world works? And I think in cancer care process, many times we underestimate the complexity and the variability in how it, it, it applies. And I think this is where it's very important to, even before you model anything, know upfront, what are you designing for and taking into consideration what the real world environment looks like and how we do that. And we did that with um, some success, uh, quite a lot of success with um, actually our, uh, some of our predictive tools that we use to help improve our advanced care planning process. And what I think is the secret success there is the interviewing folks uh, up front, understanding the care flow process up front. And as we built the model, we in parallel thought, how do we deploy it in a way that is integrated into the care process so it doesn't cause one organ rejection <laughs> within the care process. And number two, all, all along the way, we bring along folks who will advocate and rally for, for this tool and actually help accelerate the adoption of um, the data product when it's in the field. So. Great. Rima, you see a ton of organizations adopting AI at, at various points in their life cycle from maybe first trying it out to, to super advanced. Maybe uh, could you share some best practices for those organizations that have been particularly successful? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what we see is organizations that are serious about AI do a few things. One is they start with a vision and strategy on how AI will map to their desired business outcomes. Um, second, they identify business problems that can be augmented with AI. And they embed data scientists in those uh, lines of business as, you know, both Andrea and Susan were, were, were we're telling us uh, this way the data scientists will be working with teams with domain expertise uh, on that specific problem. So that, that's important. Uh, then another important thing, and, and uh, Susan, you, you talked about it, which is understanding the current workflow. Uh, the more we can understand the current workflow and embed AI into into how people really go about their business today, the less friction we're going to have. Because if we're going to go create a whole new approach, it's not going to work. So that's super important. And um, another thing that we're seeing is in parallel, we've seen successful customers establish an AI center of excellence. And that's, you know, what both Andrea and Susan were talking about, which is like that hub. In addition to having all the data scientists across the organization, you need some central group that's thinking about uh, creating a culture of continuous collaboration across these data scientists, sharing insights uh, from the experimentation, measuring success, establishing guidelines, like uh, both Andrew and Susan talked about data and data governance and access to data. So that 
that group would think about this and and have some processes and approaches that the company can adopt. Uh, also, defining an architecture and um, and an infrastructure platform for AI that can be used across the organization that will make it easy for data scientists to access compute, schedule jobs, share models, um, uh, le leverage common tools. And um, and also we were talking about adoption. Once these models go into production, we also need to monitor them, make sure that they're continuously uh, continuing to be effective. And um, so, you know, the nice thing is with all of these, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of tools out there, um, like, you know, like we talked about Domino Data Lab, has a number of these tools. And, you know, the main goal would be to make it easier to adopt and scale these, um, these approaches across the organization. Um, and then finally, one thing that I, you know, that I see across every company that's successful with AI is that they also communicate the impact of AI with their business leaders. And this way they can ensure that they have this uh, continued executive sponsorship for AI across the organization. That's great. Well, thank you all so much for uh, joining us today and, and giving great perspective and advice that I know the, the audience will find super helpful. So Susan, Rima, Andrea, thank you very much.